let us fight for a new world, a decent world that will give men a chance to work, that will give youth a future and old age a security. By the promise of these things, brutes have risen to power, but they lie. They do not fulfill that promise. They never will. Dictators free themselves, but they enslave the people. Welcome to Rabble Rants. I'm Santiago Helo Quintero, and alongside Jesse McLean, we're going to unpack the stories that have us most riled up and challenge the narratives around them. For over 75 years, international law has failed the people of Palestine. For the last six months, it has absolutely failed to stop yet another genocide. It took over three months for the international courts to even start to look at the siege on Gaza. Then, finally, on January 26, 2024, the International Court of Justice ruled a genocide was likely taking place and ordered Israel to take action to prevent further civilian harm. This is a joke considering the goals of Israel. However, they were told to facilitate humanitarian aid, stop causing physical and mental harm to civilians, and report back to the courts in a month. They did none of this. And we knew they wouldn't. In fact, Israel did not change a fucking thing about their approach. We could say since the ICJ ruling, we have seen horrific acceleration of violence. This includes the many flower massacres, which are civilians that have been gunned down by the IDF attempting to retrieve food aid. We have seen Another horrific siege on a hospital, this time Al-Shifa Hospital, has finally been abandoned by the Israeli forces only for them to find it completely razed and horrific stories that came from inside there. We've seen continual bombing of Rafa, which is the area in the south of Gaza where 1.6 Palestinians we're told to flee to. It was supposed to be a safe place. We've also seen the onset of mass starvation and the humanitarian aid has not been getting in, not in the numbers that it's needed. And this has largely been due to the prevention from Israeli forces. So what did that ICJ ruling do? Some UN member countries were asking themselves the same thing. And after two months of watching this, 10 members of the 15 member UN Security Council brought forward a motion for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. This was on March 25th. The UN Security Council, this is a UN body, this is the UN body responsible for, you know, literally maintaining international peace, whatever that is, even if that means using violence. This is supposed to be, you know, the or else branch of the International Court of Justice and the human UN Human Rights Council. It, you know, you're supposed to comply or else the Security Council comes after you. They can impose sanctions, order military interventions. They've got a bunch of tools at their disposal. We've seen them use them. And this wasn't the first attempt at the Security Council, but as usual, the United States were using their veto power there or threatening to use it. And they threatened to use it this time, except they chose to abstain and it did pass. The Security Council called for a temporary ceasefire. It was supposed to be for Ramadan, but you know, this is March 25th. That's about two weeks into the Muslim holy month and would have suggested only another two weeks of a ceasefire, which is essentially meaningless in itself. However, this was two weeks ago and, and there has been no ceasefire. Not that we should be surprised, but Israel even had the nerve to get upset with the United States for abstaining. They pulled some diplomats from an event and had a little bit of a public tiff. I mean, not that much will come from it. They thought the U.S., you know, failed their duty to Israel, abandoned their position uh, by not, again, vetoing any attempt to curtail the violence in Gaza. But since that ruling two weeks ago, we obviously didn't see a ceasefire. We've seen an increased bombing in Rafah, another event that got a lot of attention because of Westerners were killed, the attack on World Central Kitchen aid workers. Israel has admitted to bombing the vehicles of this international organization that delivers food to areas in need, run by a famous chef, and mostly Western volunteers. By the looks of it, 
And they didn't just accidentally strike it once. They actually hunted this convoy down over a stretch of about of a kilometer. Now, this is a route that was already pre-approved by the IDF, similar to the ambulances that went to retrieve Hind in Khan Yunus. There's negotiations that take place, and the Israeli army is perfectly aware of what is going on, who is there, and what they're doing. The vehicle was clearly marked And so, you know, after all of these rulings by international courts, even the Security Council for a ceasefire, they are firing precision weapons at aid workers. Not even a Security Council ruling could deter them. But this isn't to say that all rulings by the council are toothless, not for the U.S. Uh, They're usually able to utilize them to their benefit. Just recently, they passed a motion, you know, they got Japan to sponsor it with them, but it's their emotion. And the language in there is hilarious. They're condemning in the strongest terms, the two dozen Houthi attacks on merchant and commercial vessels since November 19th, 2023. So they made the time to show up and vote on this one. There's been no casualties, but heaven forbid the Houthi rebels attack some capitalist ships. So the U.S. will be able to use the ruling here and the Security Council to to justify force, perhaps sanctions for sure, other forms of coercion and violence that they're used to using uh, on the people of Yemen this time. This council often is just a rubber stamp for when they want it, but we absolutely know they don't need it. Even a cursory glance at international law tells us who it was written for and why. You add the limitations built into bodies like the United Nations, and we get what we have here. A gutless, useless organization and a set of rules that are bent, broken, ignored. International law isn't a new phenomenon. Now, the UN may have been born out of the horrors of the Holocaust. But the idea of international law or rules to govern global relations totally predates the United Nations. I mean, it even predates the failed League of Nations that came out of World War One. Side note, for the Islamophobes out there, much of the humanitarian rights that we operate under, that we fight for, Uh, that form the basis of most UN declarations on human rights actually come from Islamic laws that were written around warfare and the treatment of prisoners. But what came out of World War II and the discussion amongst the most powerful nations at the time, what that is, that is resulted in just a meaningless, racist political tool that helps really just legitimize Western imperialism. And it has most gravely failed at the one task it was specifically designed to respond to, genocide. It failed to prevent this genocide, but also the genocide of Tamils in Sri Lanka, the Rohingya people in Myanmar, the Yazidis in Iraq and Syria. Darfur and Sudan. I mean, that is still ongoing from 2003. The UN Security Council just passed another resolution. They tried to call for a Ramadan ceasefire there as well. Rwanda, Canadians will remember our role in failing to prevent the genocide in Rwanda and East Timor in the 1970s, 80s and 90s. That one went on for a while as well. And the international community completely failed in all of these circumstances. And I absolutely know I am missing some. Knowing these were genocides, you know, we might not have been aware of them to the extent that we are aware of what's happening in Gaza, like minute by minute, but we were aware that there were horrific violations of human rights occurring. And the powers that be knew exactly what was happening. But that didn't help. Just because we know we have human rights doesn't mean they're secured. It requires a lot of resources and a lot of reliance on imperialist institutions to secure these human rights. And we're absolutely failing at that. But that's not our fault. It was designed that way. The systems we put in place to deal with these issues, they're not just inadequate. Sometimes they're complicit. 
And although it's usually in times of conflict that we look to the UN, that they get the most airplay, these international bodies aren't just here to regulate against violence and war. They're supposed to be able to respond to other global issues. You know, they were always supposed to regulate trade, uh, maritime law, really any kind of point of contact between nation states, guidelines, rules, whatever. But, you know, this also includes things like COVID and climate change. The track record gets worse and worse the more you look at it. But it's not just, it's not necessarily a breakdown of international law or anything new. It's, maybe it's operating just as it was designed. An eye-opening experience I had in university, uh, I was writing a a paper on drone strikes. My goal, my initial thesis that I submitted to the professor was that the United States was breaking international law by drones to bomb people in Somalia, Pakistan, a whole bunch of nations. These were extrajudicial killings, meaning there had been no trial. This is just the U.S. intelligence services deeming somebody a terrorist. And more often than not, they resulted in the deaths of many civilians. Obviously, I was enraged by what was happening, and that's why I picked the topic. But the more research that I did, the worse that it got. And I don't just mean like the numbers of civilians killed or the increasing frequency of which these strikes were being used. What happened was it slowly became clear to me that these strikes were all completely legal according to the laws that govern their behavior. If, if we can say that anybody's behavior is being governed, you know, like the use of preemptive strikes is absolutely allowed. States really need to just feel threatened and take some precautions to avoid civilian death if possible. It's, it's a lots of gray area and it really kind of operates on that system that cops do, you know, like it's a matter of perspective. An outsider can't tell whether or not you were afraid for your life. If you say you were, we believe you were. And so we, the force that you use to prevent that fear from being realized is is apparently justified. In international law, unfortunately, it operates this way. Why? Because it was written by these goons that never wanted to really have their hands tied. And this is why the U.S. has never faced any consequences for the drone strikes or Guantanamo Bay or the coups. I mean, even when they're found in violation of international law. They just scoff at it. Back to Palestine for a minute. Well, not just a minute, but you know, the refusal to recognize Palestine as a state or acknowledge their right to armed resistance is another example of the failure of international law and its uneven application, its biases inherent. The way Israel's right as an occupier is affirmed over and over again, even though it completely contradicts all the previous rulings by these international courts, like not just from October 7th. All of this tells us that these systems were never designed for us and won't ever work for us. Yet folks keep using these mechanisms. Just this week, Nicaragua has Germany in the International Court of Justice, the same one that ruled against Israel, They've charged them with being complicit in the genocide. Now, Germany, they're like the second top arms supplier to Israel. And the goal here is mostly to stop that flow of arms. Nicaragua has a long history of utilizing the ICJ, right? They've won some cases against the United States uh, for the use of paramilitary violence. And that's one that the U.S. just completely walked out of the courtroom and never went back. Germany's in court here trying to defend themselves. It's not going very well, but what is to become of this again? It's all going to depend on what Germans decide. Also, on top of the Security Council ruling for a ceasefire, the UN Human Rights Council just on Friday passed a motion calling for an end to arms sales to Israel. Now, this, the UN Human Rights Council, is the body. It's mandated to respond to human rights emergencies, (laughs) 
which I think this qualifies for, even though we are six months in before getting a ruling from them. And this is the first time they've passed a motion regarding the siege on Gaza. 28 of the 47 voted for this motion. Germany, Argentina, Bulgaria, Malawi, Paraguay, and obviously the United States voted against fun fact, not so fun fact, the UN ambassador for the US, Michelle Taylor. I kid you not. She said, you know, the motion looked really great. It had a lot of merit. This conflict has been horrific, blah, blah, blah. We can't possibly support this because it doesn't condemn Hamas. I don't even know if these folks hear themselves. The motion was brought forth by Pakistan on behalf of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, and it passed. Canada, as you probably remember, And we had MPs vote in the House of Commons to also end the sale of weapons to Israel. I don't think that was so much influenced again by the courts, but the pressure that activists put on the politicians here. But the maple here has just uncovered that Canada, although they may say they're not sending any lethal weapons to Israel at the moment, they still plan on doing arms sales with the Zionist state, just as the purchaser. (laughs) They are going to buy the very missiles that were used to kill the world central kitchen workers. And they're going to use them in their mission in Latvia. They're going to spend $43 million on them. So even after all these court rulings and the pressure that we've put on our own politicians, still Israel is not really finding itself politically isolated like it should be. And during the episode with Dimitri Lascaris following the ICJ ruling in January, we were kind of hopeful that the ruling could be a tool for activists, human rights lawyers here in Canada and globally. Nobody thought Israel would comply, I don't think. <laughs> I mean, nobody on the episode did, but I, I, it would be hard pressed to find somebody who would think Israel was just going to stop what they were doing. But Canadian politicians, we thought, would feel some pressure. But in the end, again, I would argue that it wasn't those court rulings that ultimately forced the hand of liberals, but the massive disruptions that took place, the fact that they can't have any fundraisers without them being shut down, that city streets have been clogged with marches every single weekend across Canada, that they're spending millions upon millions policing these protests. That is what got the Liberals to move. That is what got the NDP to push for it. Because for the most part, these international rulings have not changed Israel's approach in the slightest, and it hasn't even slowed down the most awful Canadian politicians that are still very proud to support this genocide. We've got folks like Pierre... Melissa Lantzman, Kevin Vong, headlining this bullshit Israel support rally at Toronto City Hall. I can't remember what they're actually calling it. Something about bringing home the hostages, I'm sure. It's the one validating point that they still might have. And you've also got the mayor of Thornhill that needs an extra special shout out this week. He's been spending his time after seeing the violence that Zionists inflicted upon peaceful Palestinian protesters Outside a synagogue that was selling stolen land, his solution was to try to ban protests near any kind of government building, school, hospital, or religious center. And then Melissa Lanceman, she decides to take the cake just yesterday, and she tweets out a photograph of a Palestinian supporter wearing a tool belt on his shoulder that has colored smoke canisters in them. And she says he's wearing an imitation suicide vest. She invokes your typical Islamophobic trash. She sees a brown person and calls them a terrorist. A lot of people are focusing in on this fucking vest that you can buy at Home Depot for about $40. But the reality is it wouldn't have fucking matter what he wears. I mean, you put the keffiyeh on at this point and people are openly calling you a terrorist. They feel no ways about this. Those court rulings have done nothing to change the narrative in that perspective either. They still feel comfortable demonizing Palestinians and their supporters and standing with Israeli flags and justifying this genocide. I'm going to end with a quote that I've used before by lawyer Rabia Egbare. She says, 
The road to achieve justice in Palestine is long and exhausting because it disrupts international power structures and demands radical change to undo the colonial hierarchies persisting in the 21st century. Now, I don't know if as a lawyer she would agree with me, but when she says the work requires disrupting international power structures, I read dismantle and rebuild because surely there is a need for a global community, but this is not that. Well, that's it for another Rabble Rants. If you enjoyed it, make sure you share that with a comrade. Our work is 100% supported by the community, so if you can, please consider becoming a monthly patron. We've put links in the show notes. Whatever you do, keep on disrupting and keep each other safe. Thanks for listening.